Hey, welcome to edX world and another video in the IGCSE accounting series. Till now, major portion of the IGCSE accounting has already been covered. I'll give the link of the playlist in the description below. If you've not yet seen them, I suggest do check it out. I'm sure you'll get to learn a lot of concepts, a lot of accounting concepts that will help you in your examination. In this video, we're going to learn important accounting principles that one should follow when doing double entry bookkeeping and preparing financial statements for a business. We have to study all these accounting principles that are listed here. These principles are also mentioned in the IGCSE syllabus. What are accounting principles? Accounting principles are rules or guidelines that have to be followed when one is doing double entry bookkeeping, meaning recording transactions and putting them in the accounting records and preparing the financial statements. Why should one follow these principles? Because when these principles are followed, the financial statements will be reliable the users will feel confident in extracting information from them and one can easily rely on them. If these principles are not followed, the quality of the financial records and the financial statements will not be up to the mark and important decisions cannot be taken based on the information provided by the financial statements. So in our list of principles, first we have the money measurement principle. Now money measurement states that only monetary transactions that happen in the business, that occur in the business can be recorded in the accounts, in the books of accounts. Non-monetary aspects or non-monetary transactions of the business have to be ignored when doing accounting. What do you mean by monetary transactions? Monetary transactions are transactions that can be measured in terms of money. You can state the money value of those transactions. Whereas non-monetary transactions cannot be stated in terms of money, though they may be very important for the business, but you cannot state what is the money value or money worth of those transactions and hence they do not find any place in the accounting records. Now here I have some examples of non-monetary transactions which are very important from business point of view but they do not find any place in the accounting records because they cannot be measured in terms of money. Examples of these transactions introduction of a new brand by the company maybe it could change the future of the company it could be very profitable but again it we do not record the fact of the introduction of a new brand in any of the accounting records same way a company or a business having very efficient management or efficient group of employees this fact cannot be stated in the accounting records and same way let's say a competitor has launched a product which could ruin our own business but again, this fact will never be recorded in the accounting records because you cannot state the money value of these transactions. This principle states that the business and the owner or owners of the business are separate entities as far as accounting is concerned. Whenever we are doing accounting for business, we have to take up all transactions, record all transactions from the point of view of business and not from the point of view of the owner. So if there's a transaction that is happening between the business and the owner, a layman or a common man would think the, since the business is owned by the owner, what is the purpose of recording owner's transaction itself in the business? But again, if you follow business entity, you have to record all transactions that take place between the business and their owners also. Example, when an owner introduces capital or introduces assets in the business, we open a separate account called capital to show that what is the value of the assets introduced by the owner in form of capital. Same way when an owner withdraws money or assets for personal use, we have a separate account known as the drawings account to show how much worth of assets have been withdrawn for personal use. If this business entity was not there, we wouldn't require capital account and drawings account. Our next principle is going concern principle. This principle states that whenever we are recording transactions or preparing financial statements, it is assumed that the business will operate or continue for an indefinite period of time and there are no intentions of the business to either scale down its operations or close down its business operations. Now discussing the example or application or importance of this principle, whenever we buy any non-current asset, they enter our accounting records and they have to be carried forward in the balance sheet at their net book value. Net book value is nothing but cost less accumulated depreciation. Maybe the sale value of the asset would be much lower than its netbook value, then why do we show it at the netbook value and why not its current resale value? Because the business expects to use that asset in future, generate profit out of it and hence we can carry forward that asset at its netbook value. Now consider a situation where going concern is violated. 
these non-current assets will not generate that much benefit for you in the future because the business might not continue for that long and hence it won't be right to show the non-current assets at net book value in the balance sheet. These assets might have to be shown at their current sale value. How much value would you fetch if you sell them in the open market? Our next principle is duality, duality principle. As per the duality principle, every transaction in the accounting records will have two effects, debit and the credit effect in such a way that debits are always equal to the credits. And it is because of this principle only that we are able to eventually prepare our trial balance and prepare our financial statements using that trial balance. So if duality was not there, our accounting records wouldn't be systematically maintained. Example or application for this principle would be very simple. Any transaction you take, debits are always equal to credit. You never record only debits or only credits or you would never see a mismatch between debit or credit for any transaction. Our next principle is the realization principle. Realization principle presents you the guidelines or shows you how and when do we record revenue or income in our financial statements or in our accounting records. See when you sell goods, there might be a dilemma when to record revenue. Should we record revenues when we receive an order from the customer? Or should we record revenue when the goods have been dispatched to the customer? Or should we record the revenues when we actually collect the revenues in cash from the customer? So this principle provides you guidelines as to when to record the revenue. So the revenue should be recorded when the goods are actually delivered to the customers and the ownership has been transferred to them. This ensures that any kind of risk attached to the goods are no more with the business and it has been transferred to the customer. So this is when the business can confidently record revenues in its accounting records. In the same way when services are provided to customers, once the provision of services are over, the business can confidently record revenues and it need not wait to collect the cash from the customer. The cash can be collected in future, but the revenues from the sale of services will have to be recorded at present when the services are rendered. Another key point that has to be kept in mind when we are recording revenues or any kind of income is that at what point has the business established its right to receive the money at present or in future? That's the point where you will record the revenues. So when you, the goods are delivered or when the services are provided, that's when the right to receive money is established for a business and hence you should record revenues. Again, I've given you the example, never record revenues when the customer has just placed an order, wait for the goods to be delivered and the risk and rewards attached to the goods to be transferred to the customer. And you need not wait to collect the cash from the customer to record the revenues. You can record it at present and collect the cash in future. Our next principle is the matching principle also known as the accruals principle. This principle actually speaks about when to record the expenses in the financial statements, when to match it with the revenues, how to match it. So this principle clearly states that if you recorded certain revenues in the income statement, in our financial statements, when we prepare the income statement, we've recorded certain revenues, all costs and all expenses that are necessary to earn that revenue have to be transferred to the same income statement. Why? Simply so that the correct profit or loss can be calculated. If we mismatch our expenses and revenues, let's say you recorded certain revenues, but the cost or expenses related to that revenue have been transferred to the next year. What would happen? You would eventually end up overstating current year's profits and understating next year profits. Now that should not be the case. Hence expenses should be correctly matched with the revenues. Another guideline is that do not wait for the expenses to be actually paid in cash. The moment they are incurred by the business, the moment the liability to pay them has been established, that's when the business should record expenses in the accounting records and also in the income statement. Now example or application of this principle we've already seen in our previous lessons. There's a video that speaks about other receivables and other payables. There I've already told you that actual payment should not affect the transfer of rent, salary, insurance, etc. to the income statement. So even if the entire expense is not paid in cash, the transfer to the income statement should not be affected. Whatever expenses have been accrued, incurred and we are liable to pay them have to be transferred to the income statement. In the same way, in the provision for doubtful debts lesson, 
we saw that even though the debtors are doubtful, they're not yet bad debts, we still have to record them in the current period because revenues have been recorded. So it is necessary to match the related provision for doubtful debts in the current year itself and not transfer it to the next year in form of bad debts. So in this way, we are matching our expenses with the revenues properly. Another example would be depreciation, wherein the business is required to choose the appropriate method and rate of depreciation so that the expense, the depreciation expense is correctly matched with the revenue to arrive at the correct profit or loss. Our next principle is the prudence principle. Now prudence requires businesses to record all possible or expected expenses and losses in advance. If the business feels that it might have to pay out or incur an expense in future that has to be recorded in the current period itself. But that is not the case with profits or assets. If a business feels that it might earn a profit or might receive an asset in future that cannot be recorded unless it is actually earned or actually received. So this is how a business is being prudent in its accounting approach. You can record all possible expenses and losses, but not the possible or expected profits and assets. So when we follow prudence, we make sure that our profits and assets are never overstated. They can be understated. It is okay to understate them, but they should never be overstated. Example or application of this principle, provision for doubtful debts is a very good example because when you're providing for doubtful debts at present, we are reducing our profits and reducing our assets for an expected future loss. That amount could or could not be a bad debt in future. So this is how a business follows prudence by recording the expected expense in advance. When the business records inventory at lower of cost or NRV, it is following prudence because it is not recording future profits, but it is recording the future losses in advance. If you want to understand the inventory principle in detail, there's a video in the IGCSE accounting series that you can check out and the entire inventory principle is explained in detail. Historical cost. Now this principle states that all assets and expenses, all transactions when they are happening, they should be recorded at the cost of the transaction. Whatever amount has been paid out for the transaction the transaction should be recorded in the books at that amount. This amount is known as the historical cost and these assets should also be carried forward in the balance sheet at their historical cost itself. Example, non-current assets are always carried forward in the balance sheet at their cost subject to any accumulated depreciation which is reduced from the cost to and hence net non-current assets are eventually shown at the net book value. Our next principle is materiality. Materiality states that whenever transactions are recorded or whenever financial statements are prepared, the materiality or the importance of the transaction has to be kept in mind. Now, a transaction is material or it is important when it can affect the decision making of the users of financial records. If the user of the financial statement can be impacted or affected by a certain figure, by a certain transaction, then that transaction can be said to be material for the business. Now material cannot be defined in any numerical form. You cannot define that certain million dollars will be materiality for all businesses. Each business may have its own level of materiality depending on the size and nature of the business. Example or application of materiality, when stationery is purchased for use in the business, even though the stationery can be used for more than one year, Ideally, it becomes a non-current asset, but you never show stationery under the non-current asset section. The entire stationery is transferred as an expense in the income statement. Why? Because of materiality. Even if it is shown in the non-current asset section of the balance sheet, it wouldn't affect the decision of the users. In fact, it would just increase the cost of accounting because, because when a transaction is recorded as a non-current asset, certain extra records may have to be kept to account for depreciation properly. Another example for materiality, apart from the major expenses in every business like rent, salary, insurance, wages, government taxes, etc. There may be so many other small minor expenses which would be different for each business. Now when you see the income statements of these businesses, you wouldn't see all these small expenses being stated individually. Because even if they are stated individually, no one would care to pay attention at those amounts because they're not material. And hence these small minor expenses are clubbed and shown as miscellaneous expenses because this would save the time of accountants and also not affect the decision of the users anyway. Consistency states that when accounting policies or methods are chosen in any area of accounting, they should be applied 
consistently each year. The business cannot change these policies or methods as and when it wants. They have to be followed consistently each year. Now, why is this done? So that it ensures better comparability of financial statements of two firms or of the same firm but for multiple periods. Because if these policies are changed year after year, you cannot compare the financial statements of this year to the previous year because profits tend to vary with changes in policies or changes in accounting methods. Example or application of this principle, a business is free to choose its method of depreciation for its assets. It can use straight line method, written on value method or the revaluation method. But once it chooses a method of depreciation, that should be followed consistently each year. In the same way, there's something known as cost flow assumptions for inventory and there are certain methods available like FIFO, weighted average cost, etc. Now you may not be knowing about this because this is not there in syllabus. It would be covered in AS level. But just understand that if one of these methods are chosen for calculating the cost of inventory, they, they have to be applied consistently every year. Another example of consistency. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like the video. Please share it with your friends and do not forget to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. There would be more videos coming in the future. Make sure you do not miss them. Thank you.